Um, so I want to begin, first of all, asking you about At Home with the Braithwaite. It was your first original drama. Um, you took the traditional path, I guess, in the sense that you started writing for soaps. You wrote for The Archers, mm -hmm. Corrie, Emmerdale. Um, Briefly for Emmerdale. Briefly for Emmerdale. Quite a lot of Corrie, though, didn't you? you wrote yeah, I wrote episodes. that 58 episodes. 58 episodes. Um, I'm interested in that transition, first of all, from the point of view of how you persuade a producer, because mm. I know lots and lots of people who write for soaps who mm. have been trying to do that for a long time. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how you persuade a producer to give you that slot? The yeah. nine o'clock slot, the biggest slot. The big slot, yeah. Mm. But also how you make the transition from someone who's writing 23 minutes of prescribed drama, in other words, you've got a storyline, mm. you've got some uh, existing, pre-existing characters, yeah. uh, going from that to what was almost 30 hours, wasn't it, of, of original drama in the mm -hmm. end. Mm -hmm. So those two things, really. Um, it's, it's, it's like a lot of television, it's a leap of faith. It's a leap of faith on the part of the producers that you can do that, that you can make that leap. And um, I think we were talking about American Tally earlier and how they've got so much more money than us that they don't make leaps of faith in the same way. And looking back to when The Braithwaite was commissioned, it was a combination of me having shown the producers that I could turn in really good scripts quickly. And them taking a bit of a punt on me as somebody who they had faith in. So, and I, I had a lot of um, guidance from, particularly from Kay Mella. So and Kay Mella was a mentor kind of, for this. Um, she made the lead before me. She'd, she'd, um, she'd written Band of Gold. She, so she'd gone from writing and creating soaps to nine o'clock, uh, six hour dramas like Band of Gold, which was extraordinarily successful. So I was lucky that I had a woman who'd already done that. So in a, in a way, I was following in her footsteps, and she was the real um, the person who was, you know, breaking down ba ba boundaries and so barriers. When you say you had help from Kay, though, what exactly did that entail? Um, what well, did she do? I met Kay um, about 1990. Well, I first met Kay when I was at university. She came to give a talk, and um, she was touring. Um, a play that she'd written and directed and was acting in. And I went to have a drink in the bar afterwards, hoping I'd be able to try and talk to this playwright. And she was brilliant. She would, I spent hours talking to her, and she was wonderful. She instant, she was, she's, Kay is so generous. She's always interested in other writers. She's always interested in helping people. She can, she can she, you know, she recognizes passion and talent, and she, and she does all she can to help. So then the next time I met her was when I was already working at Granada. And it was about 1992. And um, I was writing, a, 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 she'd created this soap called Families. It was an afternoon soap, set half in Australia and half in England. And I got asked onto the team. And right from that point, she, she just always helped me. She, was, she gave me a phone number. She said, I'm, and she was a rock star, you know, you couldn't get near here, but she gave me a number and said, ring me anytime. Um, and then I, so I, started, I wrote Families, then she asked me on her children's show, she, again she was writing and starring in Club Justice, which was beautiful children, children's drama. It, it was one of those children's dramas that's like grown up television, it was layered, it was sophisticated. It was, it was a really, really good show and she asked me on, I think the third series to write that. Um, and so we, she, she, because she was so generous, we built up a really good relationship. And she, uh, she was always on the end of the phone, she was always happy to talk to me. Um, she, and she really, she gave me strength and courage as well as uh, well, she didn't teach me how to write. I don't, I'm, I don't think you can teach people how to write, but you can certainly encourage people, and that's certainly what she did to me. Cause it's interesting because she wrote fairly recently a drama series called Syndicate. Yeah. With a very similar idea to the Braithwaite. It's, it's well, about. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, it was about the lottery, but it was a very different um, <coughs> premise. I mean, my premise was that this woman won the lottery and didn't tell her family. But in the sense um, of money not bringing happiness, was, um, you know what I mean? That that idea is is. Similar. Well, yeah, but there wouldn't be any drama if it did, would it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Kay's idea was about a group of people, and it, and, um, and it had a very different style in that each different episode was about different people, and then each different series was about completely different people again, whereas mine was an ongoing um, series about the same people. I rewatched it recently, I got it on DVD, and I was interested to see it because it, it's a high concept idea, but actually inside that is a lot of the elements of soap, yep. um, the, the soap structure, the, the A story, the rising B story, the falling C story, the tone. Is that what they call them? Pace. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. Um, 
the tone, the pace, yeah. the kind of conflict, the neighbourly conflict that's going on in that mm -hmm. is very soap-like. Were the things you had to unlearn developing from that as a writer? I didn't. I wasn't conscious of unlearning any, anything. Um, I, everything I learned, particularly writing Coronation Street, I have kept and used ever since because it was the, it was the greatest. Um, uh, what's the word? Uh, apprenticeship. Anyone could have was writing Coronation Street. It was extraordinary. So I, I certainly have never unlearned anything I wrote there. Um, what I, what I think um, I brought to the Braithwaite's that was different from Soap was it had a lot of. It had a lot of fantasy sequences. It had musical sequences. I don't think you could do that in a soap. Um, They're almost sort of, um, well, different to uh, Potter, but mm. those kind of, uh, if you like, projections of a, of a psyche uh, yeah. put to music mm. reminded me a little bit of Potter, although you're doing it for comedic effect, where his was to sort of disturb reality, wasn't it? Yeah, I was certainly doing it for comedic yeah, effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, instead of... Uh, Alison, I think, in the third series, was giving birth. I think it was the third series. And instead of going through the trauma of showing her give birth, we just went into a musical comedy version of giving birth. <laughs> I think she was singing, um, we're having a heat with. That's right, that's right. And um, also, it's interesting in the setup and payoff as well. In the first episode, the, the inciting incident is Charlotte, the youngest member of the family buying the, the winning lottery ticket for her mother's birthday. Mm -hmm. um, that's not paid off until series three, about 15, 16 episodes later, mm -hmm. when the lottery take yep. the family to court, she's underage mm -hmm. and it's null and void. Mm -hmm. Was that story arc always there or, or was that no. fortuitous or? It was fortuitous. I think when you get, every, every different series you do of any, anything, if, you get, if you're lucky enough to get a second series, which often you don't, but um, something like Last Tango, um, each series, you have to try and think of it as a completely new ball game. Even though you've got the same characters, you've got to try and find a whole new reason for doing it again, rather than just churning out more of the same, I think. Um, and I think by the series three of Braithwaite, we were, they, they bought the mansion, they were living the lifestyle. And it's, it's finding a whole new, reason to do a series again that's just as big a concept as the original series was and we, we realised that gave us a whole new concept that not only have they won the lottery, not only she kept it a secret from the family, now they found out about it, they're going to lose it all. So, um, no, it was, it, I, I, I can't remember specifically but I think when we first planned the series there was never any idea that that was what was going to happen three years later. Um, it was just lucky that yeah. we had this joke of Charlotte being, buying this ticket and giving it to her mum saying you won't win but there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to I sort of leap forward to 2009 mm -hmm. and to your three part drama Unforgiven mm -hmm. uh, which won an award and I, I think in some way it was a turning point um, just tell us a little bit about the, the story first of all. Unforgiven? Yeah. Um, well it was about a woman who came out of prison uh, after 15 years um, and about it, it, I mean, the, the, the initial starting point in many ways was what it must be like to come out of prison after 15 years and when you, when you weren't very old when you went in in the first place and how you cope with life when you get out after that amount of time and how different the world must be. Um, and again, that was an example of a series not meant to a second series, even though it was really successful. Mm. Because in the first series there was the story of finding a sister which was very dramatic and eventful. And then I wanted to go on and do a second series that was more about just Ruth trying to cope with modern life. And ITV wouldn't commission it, even though the first series, had the, the one series, had been really successful. I want to show a clip from that, and it's, it's actually the clip where she is going to find her sister. She's, <coughs> she's not allowed to contact her sister, is she? This, the, the condition of the licence. She's yeah. out uh, on, on a murder charge, and she's out on licence, and she can't contact her sister. But she tracks her down, doesn't she? She receives an anonymous mm -hmm. letter. And I just want to roll that, that clip of that sequence of her going to, to York. She's going to York because her sister is studying music at York University. <coughs> yeah. Yeah? yeah? Definitely going to York University. Stupid adoption care plan, I'd not do with me anyway. I know you think it's 
Ruth? I just want to see her. I want to know what she looks like. She might bring the police if she doesn't understand who you are. Well, feels free to help her. Her parents certainly will if they find out you've been there and you're unlicensed. You're vulnerable. Stop and think about what you're doing, Ruth. I'm not saying this to anybody's benefit be yours. So, that's it, isn't it, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. You've always written strong female parts for, for strong characters. Mm. But then you've got a very damaged kind of backstory. You've got a, yeah. a character who's gone through a very traumatic history, which kind of bores through the present. Yeah. And that seems to be more a kind of feature of your writing from that point yeah. forward. Well, I think I realised about that time that um, there's a great strength in your narrative, if it's not just about now and the future, it's going back a long way as well. So you're writing about a character with serious history. We all have history, yeah. and it informs us all going forward. And I think that's the first time the penny dropped when I started writing about Ruth, that everything she does in the present is hugely informed by this terrible incident that's happened in the past. But, you know, we don't have, to, we don't have such dramatic backstories, but we all have backstories. And certainly when I came on to write Last Tango, um, that was, again, that was the, the present narrative was hugely informed by something that had happened 60 years ago, when Celia and Alan um, were, were suddenly unable to see each other anymore. Um, so that was, that was a big, it was a big learning point for me, that realizing that, that there's a huge amount of um, story, stuff. From, from people's pasts that will always inform the present and inevitably helps you to create uh, detailed, layered, multifaceted characters. Yeah, well, it definitely works. And just thinking about Last Tango, in fact, you've also got that backstory of a woman who's killed in her background, mm -hmm. or there's a kind of question about this. She has now. When we first started <laughs> writing it, the story was... That's the great thing, though. The more you go on, the more you have to invent. And the original story with Gillian was that it was, gen it was genuinely an accident. And then by series three, we realised that we could actually uh, alter that so that she ha had actually killed him. So, but that, again, that's, things develop. Things, uh, things change as you, uh, as you have to find more rich stuff. Well, I grew up, I guess, watching a lot of drama in the, in the early 80s when you had things like Widows, Tenko, mm. remember that? Um, Cagney and Lacey, mm. Juliet Bravo, and I know that Juliet Bravo was that a bit of an influence on. Oh, Rupi I loved Dalli. it. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. It was one of the. I've been talking about this a lot recently. How when I was younger, there were so few dramas on that were about women. Yeah. I mean, obviously the ones you've just mentioned, but you can literally list them on the hand, you know, the fingers of one hand. Um, and I used to always be look out for the dramas that had strong women in them. I don't know why. It was just what appealed to me. And certainly Juliet Bravo was one that really stood out for me. Because Cag was Cagney and Lacey an influence on Scott and Bailey? Because there's a similar... Not, not for me, personally. I mean, I yeah. did love Cagney and Lacey. Yeah. But I, I didn't invent Cagney, um, Scott and Bailey. Saran did, it was Saran's idea. Um, yeah. And um, <laughs> she, she said she, you know, her thing was that she wanted uh, to, to be in a Manchester-based Scotland, uh, Cagney and Lacey, so... And you say then that, that, that you know, we can, we can count them on hand. We just mm. mentioned four. <laughs> I can't actually think of that many others thinking about it. But, and, and you're saying that now, but actually watching your work now, I still feel that it's refreshing to, to, to see such a panoply of strong female characters. I think what it's do unusual. You, what, do you, what do you think's changed, or has it not changed? Or? I, 
I think I'm lucky and I'm rare in that I do consciously want to write about women. Um, you know, you, good writers write about what they want to write about. They, do, they don't do it because it's what, what's popular or it's what people are looking for. The things that get commissioned are the things that people are passionate about. And I, I, I love writing about women. I think women are very heroic. Um, and I think most people don't. Most people do want to write about men. Even women want to write about men. Well, Nick Comer um, said something recently, didn't he? He said he's, he's not going to write any more male protagonists. Right. Because he thinks women are more interesting now as characters. Right. And if you agree with that. Or... Well, I do, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think women are... I, I mean, I love writing for men. I've got, I love working with... Um, I've got some lovely, um, brilliant actors. I love working with, like, George Costigan, uh, Joe Armstrong. That, you know, the, I, 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 there, are, there are men I love writing for. And I hope my male characters are... As good as my female characters, it's just that I concentrate on the women. Because um, I've got a very few friends that you know, Sally Wainwright, Carl Wright, and I, which is bollocks, you know, I know that. Um, but I, I, I think women are more are, um, emotionally articulate. M women tend to talk about their feelings more, whereas men, you know, you say, How are you feeling today? They go, Good. <laughs> whereas women tell you how they feel. Yeah. Could so be a Yorkshire thing as well, couldn't they? Yeah. I want to show another clip which kind of relates to that, really. This is a scene from Last Tango in Halifax. This is the scene um, where Caroline's driving Gillian to a wedding oh. and they break down on the moors. Yeah. And I think it's a good example. You see, two men would never have that conversation. Well, this is an interesting thing, isn't it? Because I think men would do this differently. So we'll just, we'll yeah. just move on. They'd have an argument about who's changing the tyre yeah. and how to do it. They wouldn't be talking about what yeah. things that matter. Yeah. Yeah, that's a little... I knew it was a mistake before anything even happened. The Carla wanted to do it in the first place that haunts me. It really is. I was thinking that I love him. Oh, I think it still is, because obviously after that I had to send him packing again. That is so disguised. Mm. So I'm going to move the shaft on the L job in the last one. It was more of a fumble the job. The logistics were a bit of a Yeah. Okay, this is impossible. Yeah. Please see if there's good one in the factory with a pneumatic for me. Did you just stand on the lever? She's just over on doing it. No, we're keeping you clean. Stand up. Yeah. Yeah, and then you got your whole way. <laughs> and you need to jump up and down a bit. That's it. It's, first of all, it's a great piece of comedy. It's a very sort of slapstick comedy, isn't it? It's pure slapstick comedy. And we associate you with the kind of big dramatic scenes. Uh, not necessarily slapstick comedy. Um, but it's also interesting because the, the, the only male character in that scene is very much on Don't the periphery. He's is, 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 is a fairly feckless, kind of redundant character in that scene, isn't he? <laughs> and and I, love, uh, I love Gillian's reaction as well. That she's very, you know, uh, she doesn't mind muck. Uh, she can handle a spanner, find a way around a four-stroke engine. Um, you know, thinking about Virginia actually in, in the Braithwaite's, it's going back to that, isn't it? That kind of that, that female character who is very handy, you know, very mechanical. Women are. Well, I, I don't disagree. <laughs> I can't. I don't know about engines at all. But um, first of all, about the comedy, because I think you, I, 
I think comedy is always a component in your writing, mm. and yet you're, you're seen as a, a dramatist, aren't you? Uh, but that is almost like Chaplin-esque, isn't it? The little flourish, that, the way she sort of leaps off the wrench. And it's yeah. like a sort of Keaton-esque <laughs> kind of flourish, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it was probably to do with the way they had to shoot it. But anyway, um, I think comedy is really important. I think it's a really important tool of communication. I think um, we... I think human beings are funny. I think we always we, we often try and make people laugh as a matter of course. It's 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 a way to engage people. It's a way to attract people. It's a way to um, make people listen to what we want to say. Um, so I think, and I also think, however dark things get, uh, you know, things like Unforgiven and Happy Valley, particularly Happy Valley, which is why I wanted Sarah to play Catherine because Sarah is she can do the darkest, darkest stuff. She can embrace real, going into really dark places. And then she, like that, she can just make you kill yourself laughing. Um, and I think that's the best kind of drama because I think life is like that. I think, you know, the darker things get, the more we as human beings try to um, keep each other going and buoy each other up. And I think you're right about the way that that plays out with two women changing the tyre. So how do you think that would play out if it was two men and what would the difference you think? Um, I don't know if I'd ever write a, a, a scene with two men changing the time. Yeah, it's too pat, isn't it? It's too kind of... It'd be you, more funny play if you were, I don't know, putting makeup on. Yeah, yeah. Or something, I don't yeah. know, that's bad. I just think they'd be competing more. I think there'd be a kind of competitive element, which you don't see there at all. It's more cooperative, isn't it? Well, they don't care, do they? They don't yeah. care about change. They just want to change the time in the easiest, yeah. most practical way. Yeah. So it's... They're not... Ex they're, yeah. And we're up on the moors again. Mm. And again, this is a consistent feature in, in your later work, really. The importance of place mm. in your work. Um, I mean, you're aware of McKee, and, and he says that story. Keep telling me about uh, it. Really? You know, you're not read McKee? Why would I? Well, you're supposed to. It's the Bible, <laughs> you know. Is it really? I can't read it. <laughs> um, he says that a story, a, a good story, is not <coughs> transportable. In other words, character and setting are indivisible. Right. Um, and it becomes, uh, certainly in, in this, but also in Happy Valley, mm. the Calder Valley becomes yeah. uh, a kind of character mm. in the work. Mm. And then thinking about your latest project, the Bronte Project, mm. you know, such a big influence on their writing. Mm. What, do you th to what extent do you think that's true, that character and setting are um, indivisible? I think setting is really important to drama. Because I think, for, certainly for me personally, I think being real is very important to me, however absurdly funny you are, however dark it gets. I think, you have, for me, it has to be very real. It's like not being able to write for a character until I know what their name is. And the more you can ground your drama in a, a real place, the, the more real it feels to me as I'm writing it. So it's very important to me from that point of view that, to me, the, the, the Calder Valley is very real because it's where I grew up. The accent is very real because it's my accent. And if I can, the more I can make the audience believe in my in the drama that this is real and this is true and this is happening, um, the, the the better it is. So that's why I think a sense of a strong sense of place is very important in drama. I mean, I, I think if you look at really successful dramas like Breaking Bad, even that it's it's not generic America. It has a very strong, particular sense of place where it's set, um, and I think I think it, it pulls the audience in. It makes them, it takes, it's, it's like a lot of the Scandi dramas. Um, it takes us to a place that we can utterly believe in, that, that is, it might be alien to us, but we can enjoy being there. If, if you feel you're in safe hands and you, that, that is genuinely authentic, I think it does pull people into it. So for me, it's important in that sense. I, I take the point that you can't, you know, the characters aren't, if it's a really well rounded character and they, this is where they grew up and all their history is there, of course the two are going to be intertwined. Yeah. Yeah. But um, why wouldn't they be? Well, you moved away from Sobe Bridge quite a, a while ago, didn't you? Uh, um, I went to university in York. In York. And then, <laughs> and then yeah. I went to live in London. After yeah, been, yeah. And, and so it's been a while, hasn't it? I mean, do you, do you, that, that pull on you, do you think, is because you were you brought up there? Or are you tempted now to write about, you know, other places? No, no, I mean, I mean in fact, I went to live in London, and then I, for various reasons, I ended up living in Oxford. Um, and now, the older I get, the more I want to come back here. I mean, all my work is set up here, and I do feel the pull of coming back up here. 
Because there's a practical reason for that as well, isn't there? They're on the moors mm. in the middle of nowhere mm. and they can't get a signal. Yeah. I mean, it's the perennial problem of the dramatist now, isn't it? The mobile phone. It, it, you know I, I, mean? I love writing scenes on mobile phones. I mean, it's, it's hard to create jeopardy, though, isn't it, if someone can ring 999 and, or ring AA or... Well, it used to be a rule of film that you never, had, you never wrote scenes. When I started writing a uh, TV drama 300 years ago, um, people didn't have mobile phones. And I remember there was a produ Phil Redmond, who used to produce Brookside. I, I never met him, but apparently one of his big things was he never write scenes on telephones because it's boring. And I disagree with that completely. I think you can have real fun with telephone conversations. There's so much subtext with telephone conversations um, because you, people can be talking, saying one thing down the phone and pulling faces at the other end with, with, with no chance of the other person seeing them. So you can, you can really spell out the subtext in a way that is often really fun. You do that thing as well where you have two people on, on phones having separate conversations yeah. and, you, and, and you sort of have them in yeah, the same room. Yeah, you see, room. that's another great thing you can do. You can have one person on one call. Yeah. Somebody else on another. So you've got like four scenes yeah. going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that's really yeah. makes me laugh anyway. Yeah, that's a fun. <laughs> um, I want to show the clip. I want to show a clip from Happy Valley. Uh, again, this theme of place, really. Um, this is at the end of series one. Um, she's well. She's failed to catch Tommy. This is yeah. Catherine now, failing to catch Tommy in episode four. He gets away, doesn't he? And then this is the end, episode six, where eventually she tracks him down to his lair, this, this narrowboat yep. on the canal, yep. um, and she, she gets him. Um, and it's, it, I just want to run these three, these three scenes <coughs> back to back, because I just really like the way these, these kind of... Can I sit there? Of course you can. Inspector Taylor would like you to take another three weeks off work, and if he sees you inside Woodland Road, Nick, during that time, he'll kick your ass down the stairs. When your baby's born, you'll know. You'll get it. Losing a child is just, it's... The only way you can cope with it, I suspect, is to go a little bit mad. And it's never fair on other children. Your other children to see a parent like that and to have to put up with the things that are said. And I'm sorry that happened to you. I'm sorry I let it. Me and your dad probably never 
rest of the talk and everything. But we did. So. And Ryan, every day, I don't know, he'll do something, he'll be in trouble, he'll drag me up the wall, and I don't know whether I made the right decision, but I genuinely don't know what else I could have done. Uh -huh. I didn't fucking care. Uh -huh. Even though you'll hate me for it. Shame that was sticking, but you do get the idea. Um, that soundtrack's exquisite. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic composer. Very often with soundtracks, you feel that they're trying to manipulate you, or they're, they're kind of kind of mm -hmm. uh, overdone. But that seems to be completely sympathetic to mm. everything that's happening visually with the storytelling. Almost like it's 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 almost taking us into her head, isn't it? Her yeah. Yeah. Stay. Um, Ben, who writes the music, he is, well, he's very good, and um, I think on the whole, throughout Happy Valley, we actually use new music quite sparingly, and then um, towards the end of each episode, we try to find, you know, build the drama up to a crescendo, and then the music complements that, and particularly in the second series, we try to use the same uh, crescendo of music at the end of every episode, so you kind of know it's coming about three minutes before the end. And I think it has quite a subtle psychological effect that the audience knows when it's coming, the, the big end is coming. And certainly by the end of episode six. It's uh, very spare. And, series one, and series two, uh, it, it has a real effect. And what's nice there as well is that there's hardly any dialogue. Yeah. Obviously the scene between uh, mother and son, but yeah. either side of that. And, and I think looking at your work overall, you are writing where you can, mm -hmm. fewer dialogue scenes. and, and, and you, Yeah, you, I mean, that's one of the things you learn I think the older you get, the less is more, all the time. Yeah. I mean, you're developing and a more visual style, I think. Yeah. So that's true. More filming. I, th I hope so. I mean, that, that comes from wanting to direct and uh, seeing scenes in your head as you write them. Uh, and trusting your actors as well, knowing that your actor can do more with a look than you can with words. Because Sarah, <laughs> particularly with Sarah, yeah. she acts a lot with her eyes, doesn't she? Yeah. She conveys, she's very much in, in that sense. You can see what she's thinking. Yeah, yeah. And I guess the, the, that, that division between TV and film is mm. blurring, isn't it? You know, like TV used to be very talky, film was yeah. more visual, mm. and I think, well, the ratio has changed, hasn't it? Yeah. But also, I think writers are not necessarily kind of well, thinking about the two things as distinctly different. Is that, is that true? I think, I think increasingly so now. Uh, I mean, it's, I, when I started trying to tell you, it was like the very poor relation of film. Yeah. And that's changed dramatically in the last few years. Uh, you know, now we're getting huge budgets because we've got a lot of co-pro things going on now, so we're getting a lot of money from America now into British series. And because you're getting film stars now who who will be in series, I mean like um, Tom, Tom, what's his name? Big famous actor at the moment. Hardy. Hardy, Tom Hardy. He's just made a series uh, for, for t of TV for uh, an American company and that would have been, that would be unheard of. Uh, you know, only six or seven years ago. So I think I think that so rather than being the embarrassing poor relation, TV I think now is 
better. I personally think it's better than film because I think you can do more in television. You've got more room, haven't you, to develop a story? You've got more to develop things. Uh, I think you, there's, 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 there's more being made so you can take more liberties with stories. I th you know, film, film you've, you've got so many execs in, but you have in TV to some degree, but many, many less sort of than in film. I mean, that's been a revelation, really, hasn't it? Is that the audience want long stories? I think, yeah. I think there's an assumption, wasn't there? Yeah. I also think the British TV, going back many years, grew out of theatre, whereas American TV grew out of film. So inevitably, our television, our telly was a lot more talky, and I think it's become more, uh, as it's become more filmic, it's become uh, more of a visual medium and less of a. I love that final scene with her up on on the moors, and she's she's looking over the Calder Valley, and she's like a shepherd watching over a flock. Oh. And, <laughs> well, it's her manner, isn't it? It's her patch. You know what I mean? This is her, yeah. you know, yeah. the wolf's in its cage. Yeah. You know, and she's there looking over a flock. But then she takes that intake of breath, mm -hmm. and she smiles, and it's almost like she's purified, she's cleansed by, mm -hmm. by place, by, the, by, the, by what she's seeing. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just such a beautiful thing. And it's, but it's, it, it's, it's a lyrical moment, isn't it? We've had this big epical story, the overcoming the monster story. But then we're left with this kind of very lyrical moment that we don't think necessarily TV film does that well. It's hard to convey inner mm -hmm. thoughts and feelings, isn't it? But that's the... Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's about performance and it's about shots. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you directed episode four of that series, didn't you? And then, was it four...? I directed the first two and the last two of, the, of series two. Yeah. And do you want to just talk a little bit? Because I know you've, all, you've wanted to direct for a long time, haven't mm -hmm. you? Um, but it's only recently that that's happened. Why, why has that taken so long, um, do you think? Well, partly because I've had children. Right. And I think it's really hard being a director when you've got children growing up because yeah. you've got to be away from home so much. Um, I don't know how women do it, actually. It's, it, um, it, it seems to be... The, I mean, the, there are so fewer women directors than there are men directors, and that ha has to be one of the main reasons. Um, but for me also, it was a confidence thing. I think, I mean, I have always directed, ever since I was at university, I have been directing stage plays. So I would do it at university, and then I've done it just with friends on a non-professional level ever since. So when I started directing TV, I wasn't a novice. I did, I had, had quite a lot of experience. I just hadn't been paid to do it. But it was also a confidence thing. To, you know, directing TV is very different from theatre because there's a lot of technical things involved that you don't have to know about, that you, you, don't, you don't know that until you actually do it. You think you've got to know everything. And um, I was worried that I didn't know about lenses and I didn't know about lighting and I didn't know about sound. And the more you spend time you spend on the set and the more you actually do the job, you realise that other people are paid to do those things. Because your latest project, um, To Walk Invisible, yeah. is, a, is a one off film, isn't it? It's a two hour film uh, for the BBC. <coughs> um, not sure transmission dates, are we? Back end of December, around Christmas, Christmas time. Christmas, yeah. Be um, not Christmas Day. And you've written and directed this. Yeah. Um, and it's a single, by the way, it's not a series, it's a single two hour film. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about that then? Because you focus on one particular yeah, period um, of their life. The BBC asked me about five years ago to write something to uh, commemorate the bicentenary of Charlotte's birth, which is this year, as you probably all know. Um, <coughs> and so I had to think long and hard about exactly what I wanted to do. Um, they wanted it to be a biopic, they didn't want it to be particularly about Charlotte, even though it was for transmission this year. Um, so I, won I, I, I I looked at the whole family and the whole family dynamic and I chose to look at the period of the summer of 1845 to the summer of 1848, just, just <coughs> going to Ranald's death in the September of 1848. And really it's about um, the sisters who'd always written as Branwell had choosing to go down the path of publishing, trying to publish. Charlotte was very ambitious, but it was a time when it was considered vulgar for women to publish. So they had to think very carefully about whether this was something that they wanted to do or not. But what I've tried to dramatise is the fact that they, were, <coughs> they did it kind of out of desperation, because the, otherwise they, the father was very elderly, and unmarried sisters then would have relied on a brother for, their lap, for, for support. And it was cl increasingly clear that Bramwell was never, you, you know, was becoming increasingly ill with alcoholism. So it was becoming increasingly clear that they could never rely on him for anything. So the idea of trying to publish their work comes out of a, a desire um, 
sorry, it comes, it comes out of frustration rather than, uh, you know, just a, a desire to, 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 to put the work out there. Well, Charlotte um, wrote to Robert Southern, didn't she, the, the Poet Laureate? She did, time. she wrote to the Poet Laureate, who said that um, literature was, could not, not be the bitterness of a yeah. woman's life. Yeah. Um, so she ignored him. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but interestingly, what, it, the way I've dramatised is that Anne and Charlotte try and make it happen, and, and Emily really doesn't want to. Emily was an intensely private woman, and, you know, bless Charlotte, if it hadn't been for her, Emily, em, Emily would, might never have published, because she... Her, her writing was so intensely personal, she never really wanted to put it out there. Well, we've got a scene, actually, which is, which is related yeah. to what you're talking about, so should we have a look at that? So this is the scene where, <coughs> where Emily discovers that Charlotte's Charlotte looking at <coughs> <Yeah. coughs> When she, when, when Emily it's a, smacks her in the face, it's yeah. not a slap. It's a, it's almost a punch, isn't it? Yeah. Is that based on anything? Well, remember this woman wrote Wuthering Heights. She won yeah. the win. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, you know, I think Emily was a bit of a one. I mean, is that based on research, or is that just your own license, or? No, it's based on research. I mean, I, do, I, I mean, I've not read that Emily hit Charlotte, but we know that um, Emily was very upset when Charlotte found. Charlotte said she stumbled across Emily's poetry, and I think she went looking. <laughs> and um, Emily was very. Uh, Charlotte did say that she was. It took it took her several days to reconcile her, Charlotte, Emily to the fact that she'd found these poems. And we know that Emily was quite um, uh, a bit of a tomboy and quite. Well, she didn't. She took a dog keeper. Mrs. Gaskell wrote that in, in, her, in the uh, face. biography of. Of um, yeah. Charlotte, that she beat the keeper up. Yeah. So she, I'd, you know, I, I wanted to, I wanted them to feel like a real family. Based on what I have read about Emily, I don't think that's wrong. Yeah. I think that is possibly. I think Charlotte and Emily had quite a difficult relationship, from what I've read. I think Anne was the peacekeeper, um, and that's kind of what I've dramatised. Because what several things really strike me in that clip. First is that they've got very broad Yorkshire accents, and often, Why they? well, exactly. But often we've seen them portrayed with received pronunciation. Yeah. Um, but actually, Charlotte's best friend Ellen Mussey said she had a strong Irish accent, didn't she? She said she had an Irish accent. Yeah. When she went to Roe Head, um, she said that Charlotte had an Irish accent. So I, because obviously Patrick was Irish, but I mean we had a long, long, long conversations about this in rehearsal because. Patrick came over from Ireland when he was, I think, I think about 19, and he went to Cambridge. 
and he became a sizer at Cambridge. And um, so from that age, he, we, we decided that in rehearsal was, he probably moderated his accent because I think he, he was called Prunty when he got there and it, it changed to Bronte when he got to uh, Cambridge. So there were obviously problems of communication. So I assume he had to moderate his accent to some degree. And then he got married to a Cornish woman and they moved up to Yorkshire. First, um, I think his first appointment in Yorkshire was at um, Hartshead Moor. Do you agree? Is it Hartshead Moor? Yeah. Um, and so his accent must have undergone changes. And then the, the Bronte sisters uh, would grow with, the mother died, but then Aunt Bramwell came up from Penzance. So they must have had a, you know, a mixture of influence from their accents. You know, and, and Emily was very close to the servants, and that's why I think Emily might have been more broad. Mm -hmm. And she obviously enjoyed the accent because the, I think in Wuthering Heights, the Yorkshire accent is um, written much more accurately than the way Charlotte writes the Yorkshire accent in something like mm -hmm. Shirley. Um, so I had to make choices about Charlotte trying to be slightly better spoken because she'd worked as a governess and a teacher, as had Anne, and, and Emily just being that bit more down to earth because she preferred being at home. Um, Emily did teach briefly in Halifax, but it didn't last very long. She, I think she couldn't go with it. So we had to make all these choices mm. about, would, would we hear any Irish in that? Would we hear any Cornish in that? Um, I remember Jonathan, who played Patrick, he you know, spent, spent a long time working out exactly how, to, how Irish to be and how much not to be. And at different points, the producer said, I don't think I can hear any Irish in his voice at all, but I liked what he did because I think he would have tempered his accents. He would have... It would have it would have evolved and changed as all our accents do when we're in different circumstances. So I imagine when Charlotte went to Roe Head and Ellen Lucy said she had an Irish accent, that she pronounced certain words in an Irish accent because of the influence of her father. But I, ca I can't imagine she would just have had an Irish yeah. accent. Yeah, no. But she, you know, we, we we don't know. We'll never know. Yeah. But we had to make choices. Well, the thing that's striking is the height differences, and I know that in real life. Uh, Charlotte was four foot eleven, wasn't she? And Emily was five foot ten. Yeah. So there's almost a foot difference in height. So it's quite a marked difference. Mm -hmm. But I've never seen that portrayed uh, as accurately as that. I was really keen to get that right because I wanted to. First of all, I wanted to cast people who weren't famous names, particularly. Because that's interesting. And I wanted to get the physicality work. as right as I could. So it was really important to find a little Charlotte and a big Emily, and fortunately we did. And they were also the best people for the job as well. Because so. I was going to ask you about that, because you, you, you've worked with a lot of the actors, the same actors. And Charlie plays Anne. Charlie, I don't know if you really noticed, but she, she also plays Anne Gallagher in Happy Valley. And um, the reason I asked Charlie to do it is she just has a really striking resemblance to all the portraits I could find about. But she, so, I think she's so the only actor you've used from previous work, though, isn't she? Is yeah. that all? No, is that not? No, but Adam, who played Bramwell, he was in Happy Valley. Oh, of course he was, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and Emily Jonathan. <laughs> But was it important to mainly cast you or unfamiliar actors? I wanted to cast unfamiliar faces to play the Brontes because I want people as much as they can. It was, um, I wanted it to feel like we were really stepping back in time. I really wanted it to not feel like a typical um, sanitised BBC dressing up box. <laughs> Draw, you know where they've all got white teeth and you wouldn't be surprised if they got the mobile phones out. <laughs> I wanted it to feel much more down to earth and real. And I, I thought by casting not famous faces, and there was some pressure to cast, uh, you know, famous uh, young people. And I bet it was, yeah. Easy. And I, I thought the more unfamous they are, the more the audience hopefully can believe that this really might be what it was like. It's interesting because it is a departure in the sense it's historical drama, <coughs> but it's a dysfunctional family again. Yeah. And in fact, it's three sisters who don't get on who argue well, a different. Well, were, uh, in a way, I suppose they were the ultimate dysfunctional family yeah. in many ways. You know, Bramwell mm. was very ill with alcoholism and possibly drug addiction. I, d I don't think it's it's kind of been disputed now about whether he really was addicted to opium or not. But he certainly <coughs> was um, addicted to alcohol. Um, Th this seems, seems to be a theme, though, isn't it? This, this that you write about these dysfunctional families, yeah. uh, almost in everything, really. Uh, what, what, what is it about dysfunctional families, do you think, that...? Well, again, like I said earlier, drama isn't... You can't write... There's no drama in happiness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are, what I meant is there are other subjects other than families, so, you know what I mean? You could write about, I don't know, Trump or what else happened in Aleppo or... You yeah. know what I mean? There are lots of things out there. You, yeah. you focus on family yeah. drama. What, what is it about that? Um, 
well, I think it's good drama. I mean, drama is about people and relationships. And I think the most intense relationships are with families. Because, you know, you can choose your friends but not your family. And I think that's where, you know, they're the people you know the, the best because you've grown up with them. And often they're the people you have the, the most intense arguments with. So it's, it's, it just blends itself to drama. It's that extreme, isn't it? They love and hate a member of your family, so, so you know. Yeah, but you're always so, bound to them. You're yeah. always, not bound to them, but they are the people who know you best. And they're the people who, you know, uh, know your weaknesses and who will tell it you like it is rather than... I'm just like looking it. at this audience and thinking we should ask some questions from the audience. <laughs> Do you want to put the lights up so we can see uh, people? Uh, I think you're up yep. first. Following on from what you just said, um, is it your position as a writer that enables you to more or less control who you get cast? Um, I, I suspect that in most cases the casting is done by the producers and independent from the directors, and of course these days they have casting directors as well. We, uh, the process we have is that we have a casting director and she will read the script and invite people in. Uh, people I've asked for, or people are direct, if I'm not directing it, people the director has asked for, or the executive. And then we will sit in a room with, I'll sit in a room with the director if I'm not directing, and the producer, and the casting director. And we audition people. Um, but it, it varies. I mean, a lot of parts are casting for, some parts like Happy Valley, you, you wouldn't think audition Sarah, you would just offer it. But normally, as a writer, you wouldn't get a lot of control, would you, unless you had... It, it varies. I mean, when I started out, I didn't have any control at all. No. But I was always interested in the production yeah. side. So every production I've done, I've got more and more involved in the production side and learned more and more about the production side. Mm. Um, some writers don't want to do that. Some writers just want to work the script, write the scripts and walk away. Some people, more and more writers are starting to direct their own work. So it, it depends who, what level you're at. Uh, it depends on your own desire to get involved or not. But I've always been very involved. Um, I think it's important. I think if you've written a script, you've got a really clear vision about what it looks like, and part of what it looks like is who's, who's playing the part. So. And, and because you kind of know before who is going to act in these roles, does that affect how you write the part then? It helps me visualise it. Yeah. So, I mean, you don't have to end up with the person you visualised. I, I, I wrote um, the BBC years ago did a um, modern Chaucer series and I was asked to do The Wife of Bath and I just, um, and, and Julie Walters played The Wife of Bath and then I went on to write a drama called The Amazing Mrs. Pritchard about a supermarket manager who became Prime Minister. <laughs> um, and I wrote it with Julie in mind and Julie was going to do it for long enough and then at the last minute she decided she didn't want to do it and we cast Jane Horrocks, it was wonderful, but I'd written the whole thing with Julie in my head. So it's, as long as I've got somebody in my head. Uh, fortunately, most of the time I do get the person I've envisaged. Just, just thinking about that, that Prime Minister, the story, uh, the Mrs. Pritchard mm. story, and what's happened today. Mm. I was thinking, is there a political dimension to, to what you do? Um, I think, in, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't consciously write in a political way, I suppose, with um, things like uh, Scotland Daily and Happy Valley, because I work very closely with Lisa, who's my police advisor, who's here today. And um, on Scott and Bailey, I work very closely with Diane Taylor, who's a detective. You, you inevitably put things in about the state of the police and how police officers on the ground respond to the powers above them. But I, that, that's kind of a byproduct, it's not an intention. Do you take your police advisor everywhere you go? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want one. The great, eh? <laughs> um, I think. You're next, yeah. Uh, a couple of things that you've said uh, about the visual, particularly after the last question and also earlier talking about television becoming more filmic and voice is more. Just makes me wonder, is it writing for radio, does that make the approach very different going back to the time writing for the arches or is it, it, do you still have the same approach in terms of the formulating the story and how you put that together? No, I mean, writing radio is different. Um, I remember when I wrote a trial script for the Archers, um, I got feedback from it and the producer said, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to create more. 
you've got to put, you've got to, you've got to create more visual ideas to put in the audience's mind. Um, and, it, and it is hard. It does, it does mean that the, the, the dialogue is inevitably slightly more um, heavy, I suppose, because you are creating images just with not the with words. But um, uh, so it's 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 making. It's, it's harder to make it sound naturalistic when you're being so, uh, you're, you're having to create more than just, uh, although I did, the more I wrote the actual the more I realized you can, you can enjoy sound effects more, you can get a lot across with sound effects. Um, but it's, I, I, I it, it, does, it is inevitably more um, heavy, I suppose, for radio drama. Uh. I think you're next. I found the music department as a creative arts building. I'm interested in the soundtrack and to what extent as a writer that music is something you're thinking about when you're writing or whether you're involved in sporting mm -hmm. or um, you know, any decisions around the soundtrack. I often have some music playing around in my head when I'm creating a series. Almost always actually. Um, Do you write to music? Do I write it? When you write, do you have music on? No. No, always silence. Yeah. No. Um, so I always usually have a, something that's inspiring me to write. I'm writing something about the mystery at the moment, and I'm listening to a lot of bass and it's brilliant. Because it's of that the same period when she was around. I think slightly earlier, but she, certainly she'd be aware of bass and, and it's really inspiring me at the moment. And I'm going to suggest that when we start production. But what tends to happen is you get a, producer, uh, a composer on board so rather than use Beethoven, he will write something that's, he'll listen to that and it hopefully it will inspire him and he'll come up with his own version of something. I'm certainly involved in spotting, I think that's really, but it, important. But um, I, I think what the composer brings to me is a bit of a little bit of heaven and magic because they do something I could never do myself. And it, it, it indulges with, the, you know, when you finish um, editing the piece together and you've locked it. Um, you hope it's good and you know it works. But then the composer will come along. Uh, particularly the guy who works on um, Talk Invisible. I mean, I, the music for that I just think is exquisite. I think he's just done a, an extraordinary job. Um, and it's almost always the case that uh, music used, used, used really well, and often sparingly, but in just the right moment could just lift a drum. Just, I think a really good music can make a program. I, c I think you can make or break a program, actually. I think really bad music can destroy something. <coughs> and, um, what's going to say? All the, all the really good shows, the, good, the shows that really hit and make a mark, almost invariably have really fantastic type of music. And I think that's because when people turn it on, it brings an energy and an expectation and a delight and a, it's the audience. So. You ever like Coronation Street's uh, music? Yeah, it's done so well, hasn't it? It's such a yeah. miserable. It's <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. I'll come to you in a sec, because I know you, but I think you're next at the back there. So that's before the screening. On the that's screen. before it's yeah. transmitted on telly, yeah. You're next. So you commented when you first started the industry. So who should we be looking out for? Who are you mentoring? Um, <coughs> I've had a few students who have been doing creative writing courses. Um, Do you get approached a lot? Yeah. Yeah. 
What's your standard reply? <laughs> Bugger off. <laughs> no, I, I always try and help people, but the reality is that, you know, you start off with good intentions and then you, <coughs> you inevitably let people down because you haven't got time to see things through. So it's, uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, I mean, when Kay was mentoring me, I was already working. Um, so she was helping me because I was writing shows that were, I was working on for her. I think that's what I had in my mind, yeah. So if there's somebody working there that you kind of can dip in and mentor. Yeah. Um, but I tend, not to, I, I tend not to work with other writers much. Um, I think did a bit on Scott and Bailey. Um, but I found it quite hard. I think, I think it's a real skill. I think teaching is a great skill. And Kay was very good at it, and I probably not a very good teacher. But um, so yeah, yeah I, I, I try I try and do what I can, but I'm, it's like today I'm, I'm just not very good at teaching. You're doing all right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the back there. Um, it was the Archers. Um, I, when I was at university in my last year, I took a play to the Edinburgh Festival that I'd written and directed. And um, I wrote to as many people as I could think of in the TV industry, including a number of agents, and nobody came. Uh, except one agent wrote back and said she couldn't come, but could she see the script? So I sent her the script, and she took me on on the strength of that script which was lucky. And um, then I went up to London to, because everybody said, if you want to be a writer, you've got to go and live in London. So I went to live in London, and I, I became a bus driver. I, I drove buses for 18 months. And then Meg, who was the agent, got me this gig doing a trial script for the Archers. And I resigned from being a bus driver because I was so determined that this trial script was going to work. <laughs> Naive, gosh, stupid. But it did work, and um, so from leaving university, it, it, it was about 18 months before I got offered the job on the Archers. Were you a fan of the Archers before you wrote for them? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> During? After? I loved it. Right. When I got into it, I really loved it. It's, it's, a, it's a lovely show, the Archers, but my, my mum was a big fan. She listened to it. It was on in the house all the time, but I heard it, but I didn't listen. Um, but my mum was a really big fan, so she gave me a crash course on who everybody was. And all the current storylines. And then she helped me come up with my story for my transcript. Handy. But I wrote the diary. <laughs> um, so, so I've got my mum to thank for that. Your mum did your homework for you? Yeah. yeah. No, I did the homework. <laughs> I just did my mum to do it. First of all, so thanks for some great drama. Happy Valley One episode of the best ending that I've ever seen. Um, and secondly, on your desert island <coughs> discs, yeah. you talked about Victoria Wood. Yeah. Twice. No, three times. Um, uh, first time was when I was a student. She came, she did a gig at York. And um, me and my friend Hilga went around to the stage door afterwards. Uh, which was really funny because she, she assumed we'd come to get her autograph. We hadn't, we'd just gone to look at her. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, she said, what do you want me to sign? And I hadn't got anything for it to sign, so she signed my checkbook because it was the only thing I had. <laughs> and then the second time I met her was when I wrote Coronation Street. She, she, Carolyn, who was the pre executive producer then, she used to give us a treat at Christmas. So we had these big, mad, lavish Coronation Street Christmas parties. And the surprise that year was that she'd got Victoria Wood to come and sing Barry and Frida to us. And then Victoria had to go around shaking everybody's hand. So by the time she got to me, she was like, oh, shit, <laughs> <laughs> So. That, that was nice. But she was very, I got the impression she was very shy, and I'm very shy, so it was like, hello, sorry, bye. <laughs> um, and then the last time I saw her, me and Lisa went over to um, a preview of the musical she had on the other one with Michael Ball in Manchester. <coughs> that day we sang. That day we sang. Well, Opera House, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And uh, Lisa was saying, go and, go and say hello, go and say hello. And I, and, I, and I was like, and I was too shy, I was thinking she we won't. And now, of course, I wish I had, because. But I, I, I was, it was terrible when she died. I was really sad. I think she's inspired so many women over so many years. Yeah, I mean, she, I think she totally changed how women are dramatised and perceived and uh, the way women are represented on television. It's 
Uh, if we've got time for what, maybe two more questions. Yeah. Go back to the time when you were driving the bus. So we were driving the bus, did you write? Not at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, did everyone get that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did, I tried to. I mean, that's why I chose that job, rather than trying to get something like clerical. I thought I could leave my brain free to think. So I, did, I read a lot when I was driving buses. When you were actually driving. <laughs> in America, I've just come back from America. In America, everybody in the car is looking at the mobile phones like this. And they, what they're doing is they're looking at the sat maps, but they're not actually looking at, they're not texting, they're looking at the sat maps on the mobile phones. And you're sitting in the passenger seat going, no! Because <laughs> Magnus Mills, he actually wrote his first novel, didn't he, while he was driving the bus? Who? Magnus Mills. Oh. Never heard of him, have you? <laughs> <laughs> he, wrote, he wrote his first novel was Restraint of Beasts. Yeah. And he wrote it on the other little as you pull your tickets out, the blank bits. Mm. He just wrote it on that as he was driving. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have you? No, no. But I think yeah, last question. Any tips? Um, Do you mean actually about the writing or about how to get yourself out there? How to get yourself out there. You've just got to keep trying. You've just got to keep knocking on doors. You've got to. I would think about the TV shows you really like. Look at who makes it. Look at the executive producer name at the end. Like I work with Nicola Schindler a lot at Red. So at the end it says executive producer me and Nicola. So. Look for the company who makes it. Look for the executive producer and write to them. Write to as many of them as you can. The producer, write to them. Um, send you, have a piece of work that you're really happy with that is finished. A really good, solid piece of work. Not an idea, not the beginning. The, the whole good, solid piece of work. And ask them if they will read it. Red pride themselves on reading everything. So they're a really good company to approach. So Red still do that, do they? They still read everything they yeah, get? everything. Um, and the, 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 other, the biggest thing you can do is get an agent. Uh, so right, find, out, find out who the good agents are, who, who would take on someone new, because they won't all take on someone new. So you could be wasting your time knocking on certain doors. So find out who will take look at new work and send it to as many <coughs> people as you can think of. Pest people really keep pestering people. So look, if you've got, if you're confident that what you're writing is good, put it out there and don't be ashamed to do that. Yeah, I think persistence is so important, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Particularly now, it's hard and hard, isn't it? Um, okay, I think that brings us to the end, folks. So can we put our hands together and thank the panel? <laughs> of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.